Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay, coming to you from Washington, D.C. Joining us for again from Frankfurt, Germany, is William Engdahl. He's the author of the new book, Full Spectrum Dominance, Totalitarian Democracy in the New World Order. William, you, you told us a bit in the first segment that full spectrum dominance essentially is the, is the military and I guess foreign policy fundamental objective, it really even since World War II, I suppose. Uh, yep. So in the first segment, we talked about the uh, uh, moves by China, Russia, with Iran and other countries of the region to create the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, to create a kind of counterbalance to U.S. dominance in the region. So, so within this geopolitical rivalry that's taking place, what do you make of the events that have been taking place in Iran since the election? I think what's, what's been going on in Iran since the elections on June 12th has been a mishmash of uh, foreign policy intervention on the part of Washington and certain European governments, a mishmash uh, because the perceptions have changed and, and also the tactics have changed in the course of that. Fundamentally, Iran is another color revolution of the sort that we saw in Georgia in 2004, in uh, Ukraine uh, a few months earlier, the so-called orange revolution in Ukraine that put Washington's favorite dictator, uh, uh, Viktor Yushchenko, in power, pro-NATO and so forth, and uh, uh, several other countries encircling Russia in the former Soviet Union. Now, uh, what, what is the evidence for that, William? What, well, I've interviewed quite a few Iranians uh, who, who, who say that this is, in fact, that is, this is not a colored revolution. They say there's no evidence of it, that in, that in, in the, co the colored revolutions, it was actually relatively public. The Americans sent people to help organize students. There was clear uh, trail of American money, American know-how, and organizational yeah. technology. Um, there's very little evidence that that's, that's the primary force that, at play here. There seemed to have been a, a genuine struggle amongst the elite that's still going on, a, a furious power struggle amongst the elite, which seemed to have created an opening for what seemed to be legitimate demands of a people's movement. Um, I, I, I personally, I can't imagine the CIA isn't doing whatever they can, but the Iranians I'm talking to say this is not the, the driving force of what's happening on the streets. Let me uh, comment on that because I'm, I'm familiar with these arguments. The, the, the YouTube pictures that the whole world has uh, looked at in the last two weeks of, of thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands uh, of Iranians marching through Tehran are, are, uh, are real pictures and there I know uh, Iranians of, of the under 30 uh, age bracket and they're fed up they want to drive sporty cars and and uh, wear blue jeans and look like their Western uh, counterparts just like uh, kids under 30 do anywhere that being said the US government has had a program in place a covert program Pentagon, U.S. State Department, Department since at least 2007, according to Cy Hirsch, uh, some $400 million for Iran regime change destabilization in the Kurdistan areas, in uh, southeastern Iran, in several different places on the borders of Pakistan. And I think what we have with the elections around Ahmadinejad uh, versus Mousavi, you have, first of all, you have a faction fight within the Iranian power elites. Rafsanjani, uh, said to be the wealthiest man in Iran, is very much a pro-Western, market economy, free marketeer and so forth, a very powerful man, said to be a, a billionaire many times over through his involvement in almost everything commercial in the Iranian economy, especially the energy sector. Rafsanjani is the patron of Mousavi. By the way, Mousavi is no saint. Much, much of the uh, uh, Western blogs have been caught up with the idea that Mousavi is some kind of knight on a white horse. The man was the creator, uh, co-creator of Hezbollah uh, back in the 1980s. He was, he was uh, uh, intimately involved in the Beirut uh, embassy bombings against the U.S. personnel there in, in the uh, Reagan era. So, But William, doesn't that actually show then that Mousavi is not necessarily pro-Western, first of all? And second of all, there's, there seems to be very different forces at play here. Uh, Rasen Jani is one force. The, the economic program proposed by Mousavi is quite different than what Rasen Jani has been proposing. Precisely. Uh, Precisely. Mousavi has been uh, essentially, uh, my, as I've been told, is much more in defense of a public sector. Rasen Jani is much more into 
kind of Western style neoliberalism, but so is Ahmadinejad. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the other thing is that the people I've interviewed that have, that have been talking to Iranians, I've talked to people that were actually there, and, and that, it, that the people on the streets are far, far wider than in terms of the spectrum of the politics than people that just want to wear blue jeans, which in fact, people, a lot of people are already wearing blue jeans. But there were, there, the trade union movement in Iran was in the streets. Uh, there were conservative yeah. clerics in the streets who were opposed to Ahmadinejad. There were, there were many of the, of the southern Tehran, there was much of the, uh, the poor working class was there because of 50% uh, unemployment rates in sections of Iran. Yeah. That's a far broader scale than just uh, some people looking to dress and have cultural habits as in the West. Paul, the point is that that's well said and done, but that's the perfect ingredient for triggering a destabilization and uh, maximizing input through things like Twitter, through YouTube, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All you need is a tiny little handful of a few people who've gone out to the West, been trained and sent back in. Not that you send USAID uh, uh, people on the ground in Tehran. No, that's, that's not what we're looking at. It's not the same uh, exact template that you had in Georgia. That's why some people are confused. But the, I think the U.S. grand strategy is to maximize chaos and confusion, to take advantage of the economic crisis in Iran. Keep in mind, oil prices going from $147 down to $30 a barrel in 12 months or even less uh, had a devastating impact on, on the, uh, uh, the economic situation inside Iran, which is dependent on oil export for its, for its earnings. So there are huge economic problems in the country by all accounts. And uh, there's a tremendous, uh, most of the Iranians uh, alive today were born after 79, after the revolution of Khomeini. So uh, they've known only that. And they, uh, you know, I think it's mixed up with many, many different sentiments. But that's kind of uh, getting caught up in the forest tree uh, paradox here. The main point is, what is U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran? But before we do that, I just don't think it's fair to what's going on to, to like the majority of people in the streets, I've been told by all the Iranians I speak to, are not on the internet. Most of them have, don't, have never even heard of Twitter. In fact, it was text messaging was the main thing that got things started yeah. until they turned the text matter. messaging off. It's irrelevant. Well, well, why is it irrelevant? Yeah, because one, once you get the thing started, it takes on a life of its own. And that's the point. Because Rafsanjani and a powerful faction inside Iran wanted... Uh, Mousavi declared uh, that the election favored him before the polls were even closed. Uh, what did that do? That legitimized his complaint that he was robbed of the, of the election victory, and that galvanized the people onto the streets. Then that took a changed form, according to Iranian friends that I've discussed with, and it changed after about a week of that from a pro Mousavi uh, uh, demonstrations that he he's our man and so forth to a actual let's change the whole system. We're sick and tired of, of the uh, molocracy, the theocracy here that we've had uh, for the last 30 years in Iran. We want uh, free liberal Iran. Okay, once that kind of thing gets started, it's very, very difficult for anyone, uh, uh, the security forces or whoever, to control it. And that, I think, has been the, uh, the behind the scenes, less visible uh, uh, objective of, of Washington foreign policy. The aspirations of the Iranians on the street are human, they're understandable, they're legitimate. But I'm, I'm not talking about that here, Paul. I'm talking about who's stirring the pot, who's uh, uh, putting little uh, signals in here and there that provide the critical uh, ingredient at key points. And there, I think it's a color revolution. I'm sorry. I think the point you made, though, is really the most significant, is it starts with a section of the Iranian elite. Rasanjani, Musavi, they're the ones that, that opened the door to this. They didn't need anybody okay. from the outside doing it. They, they're the ones that called people onto the streets. Yeah. Now, one question is why did President Obama take such a very restrained position on the, uh, the Green Revolution? It's a color. It's a Green Revolution, uh, as it's being called by its supporters. So why did, uh, why did President Obama take such a, a uh, cautious uh, public stance on the thing, although condemning the violence uh, of the regime and so forth. I think the point is the following. Obama is president of the United States because the establishment realized they had gone down the road of raw, brute power force projection of the Bush-Cheney era for eight years, and it stood to lose everything in terms of America's role in the world. They had to put a kinder, gentler face 
on American hegemony, and that face is called Barack Obama. And Obama's whole diplomatic ploy since he uh, has been in the White House has been to project to the Arab world, to the Islamic world, uh, Persia or Iran not, not being uh, Arabic primarily, but, uh, but Persian, to project a new foreign policy, a new friendly face in contrast to the Bush-Cheney years. So Obama has no choice. He has to appear to be restrained and not interfering blatantly in the internal affairs of, of uh, Iran and, and their settling of their election dispute. Uh, if you look at what he did in, in Istanbul in April or Ankara in his visit there, he's playing a very, well, the State Department and, and the strategists behind the administration are playing a very sophisticated, uh, deeper game of trying to tilt the power geometry away from China, away from Russia, away from Eurasia, and bring it back closer into the orbit of the United States, as is Saudi Arabia from all accounts. The, the, I don't see why both things can't be true, which is you have a, a genuine movement of the people for democracy in Iran and the Americans try to use it and, and do what they can to assist it, to destabilize. And sure, Obama, uh, he knew, he, certainly the Americans would know it would be a kiss of death for that movement. The, the more the Americans endorse the movement, the more it's a kiss of death because widespread yeah. public opinion in Iran is, uh, is in defense of Iranian sovereignty and they don't want to feel at all pushed around or manipulated by the Americans. I think the Iranian people are a very sophisticated people politically and uh, pick up on those nuances uh, extremely fast, much more than uh, some people I know in, in uh, so-called Western countries. Uh, but well, the, the progressive Iranians, anti-imperialist, if you want to use that language, and the reason I am using that language is because Ahmadinejad uses the language, but people I'm talking about to Iran who consider themselves anti-imperialist, they don't believe Ahmadinejad is anti-imperialist, and they think his use of that rhetoric is a, is a smokescreen. And, and mm -hmm. they, they don't understand, actually, we've done interviews with young Iranians who, for example, are big fans of Hugo Chavez. They don't understand why many of the for, what they consider progressive forces are in this alliance with Ahmadinejad. And, and uh, you know, Ahmadinejad calls himself anti-imperialist. But this is the same Iran that helped the Americans invade Afghanistan. It's the same Iran that helped the Americans uh, prop up the Maleki government in Iraq. They're the same Iran that negotiated the deal of Basra. They collude and they contend with the Americans. I don't see where the anti-imperialism is in Ahmadinejad. I, I don't like the term, frankly. I don't think it's uh, descriptive of anything meaningful. Uh, I, I, in today's world, it may have meant something in, in the 1960s, but certainly not today. No, I think Iran's foreign policy under um, uh, Ahmadinejad uh, has been one of, quite simply, realpolitik, pragmatism. You've got a, a giant uh, monster with uh, nuclear teeth on your door surrounding Iran in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in uh, Iraq after 2003 literally uh, every corner of, of Iraq. So, And another one in the Middle East called Israel, which is a supplement to that arsenal. So you, you don't go out of your way to anger that, uh, that paper tiger, as Mao, uh, Mao Zedong once said uh, back in, I believe, in the 60s, well, the paper tiger has nuclear teeth. And, uh, you know, the whole hype about uh, Iran's nuclear program, I think, is more hype than it is reality from everything I've seen and heard. I, I'm not uh, privy to the internal secrets of Iran on the nuclear question, but uh, I think that is a projection of something saying, okay, we are not going to be seen as being subdued by this awesome military full spectrum dominance projection of the Pentagon that we've seen all throughout the Middle East. So it's from Iran's relatively weak military position, it's a clever strategy as foreign policy to be seen occasionally helping the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis supply lines in Afghanistan or uh, toppling uh, this or that, uh, but at the same time trying to maintain a, a national independence. It's a very complex game and, and uh, certainly not a simple black-white one. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm getting at is that within this system of imperialism, if you want to use the language, there, there are many contending powers and, and, and its relationship with the dominant imperialism, U.S. The others vie for their positions. But, but the problem I'm trying to raise is that within this system, when you have an Iran which 
colludes with the U.S. with the United States when it serves its interests, contends otherwise, which is fair enough. That's what these states do. But when the people have a legitimate movement and legitimate grievances against that regime, if that regime has kind of positioned itself as anti-U.S., then automatically everybody's saying, well, that movement must then be just some outgrowth of the CIA or just a manipulation of the U.S. And I'm saying it's more complicated than that. There is a legitimate... I agree with you on that, yeah. Paul. I agree with you on that. It's much more complicated. Much more complicated. That being said, what is Washington policy? What is NATO policy vis-a-vis -vis the unrest, the legitimate uh, grievances? Call it democracy. Call it uh, more liberal uh, this or that. Uh, I have yet to see an organized form of, of presenting the, uh, the grievances in, in some kind of way that uh, could be points for negotiation. That might be an interesting development. We may well see it. But my point is uh, it was ripe for such a uh, situation regardless of what uh, Ahmadinejad's voting uh, tally was or was not in the election. And uh, that this would have uh, been triggered off in any case. Yeah, I agree with that. But I guess I would just add one one point to it, which is nothing has strengthened Ahmadinejad and the Revolutionary Guard more than eight years of axis of evil rhetoric, more than threats from Israel about attacking Iran. This mm. th this aggressive posturing of the United States and Israel for the last eight now nine years. Uh, gave that regime everything it wanted to create a public opinion within Iran that we're the only ones that can defend your national dignity and sovereignty. It, it, this, this rhetorical uh, yeah. partnership, if because I, I guess it was very it's interesting. A, it's, a, it's a perverse kind of uh, yin-yang between the two sides. I, it's interesting on that point, Paul, is that the uh, Netanyahu just reappointed uh, the head of the Israeli Mossad, the foreign intelligence arm, uh, and the, on his reappointment, he made a comment saying, thank God that uh, we don't have Mousavi as our uh, counterparty as, as president of, of Iran, because uh, Mousavi would have been an absolute disaster to work with. Better, uh, implicitly, what he was saying is better the evil that we know than the, uh, than the one that we don't know, and uh, that Ahmadinejad is an easier uh, 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 counterparty for his, Israel to deal with in the world's public opinion. And I, th I think that's uh, probably their thinking on that. I have no reason to think otherwise. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if they really do plan a, an attack on Iran, it's a he heck of a lot easier to attack an Ahmadinejad Iran than a Mosavi Iran with all, yeah. these, all the green flags waving around. I think that's a good point. Mm. Thanks very much for joining us, William. Look forward to doing it again. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. There are times when reality just asserts itself. In spite of the haze created by television news and entertainment, sometimes crisis rips a tear in the fabric of myth and propaganda. Now a profound economic crisis has ripped asunder the American dream itself. Millions of people losing jobs and homes. They lack proper health care and any real sense of security. Since 2001, workers' wages have fallen or remained stagnant, even though worker productivity has risen almost 33%. By 2006, the top 1% of households were receiving 23% of all pre-tax income, more than double what it was in the 1970s. It's the greatest concentration of income since 1928. As unemployment rises, we need to know why this crisis is happening and what we can do to defend ourselves. Why are wages so low? Why is the society so laden with debt? Is it in ordinary Americans' interest to have a trillion dollar military budget to project power across the globe? Corporate television news won't ask these questions, let alone try to find answers. Only a truly independent news network can tackle these questions with courage and with ordinary people's interests in mind. We need a news network that's independent of corporations, governments, and political parties. We need the real news, but there won't be a real news network unless we raise substantial funds right away. The current financial crisis has hit our funding hard. Together, we do have the power to turn it around. There are already hundreds of thousands of people watching the real news every month. If everyone pitches in, we can build an internet and cable television network 
that will change the face of media forever. You can organize house parties, talk to friends at school and at work, send email blasts and spread the word. Distribute this video to everyone you know. Pick up the phone and call a few friends and suggest they visit therealnews.com. Invest just 10 minutes a day to ask friends and colleagues to join the campaign to create a truly independent source of internet and television news. Together, we can build this network. Just 50,000 people at $10 a month gets us to our first level of sustainability. You can help us reach this goal, and when we do, we'll move to television in millions of homes across North America. Help us reach an audience in the millions. Please contribute generously. Spread the word. Let's make the Real News Television Network a reality. Your tax-deductible donation makes it possible. Please contribute at therealnews.com.